All right, everybody, welcome back to Contemporary American Literature. We are continuing our look at post postmodern poets and nonfiction writers this week. We will now come to our third uh, poet of this uh, this moment in the course, Louise Glick, who, interestingly, uh, recently uh, became, I think, one of the most important poets in America. If she wasn't before, she probably she she was before, but she's now become something close to a household name because of an event that happened uh, at the end of of twenty twenty. Uh, so, who is Louise Glick? Well, she was born. In 1943, in New York City, to a Jewish family, uh, I think her uh, grandparents had been immigrants, and she grew up on Long Island. And her father, interestingly, was the co-inventor, I think, with her uncle of the Exacto knife, and so I think that's where the family uh, made, made their money, so to speak, um, through this invention. So that's an interesting uh, fact. And she also there's she doesn't write about that in her poetry though. She's very autobiographical in some of her work. There are two things that she does write about in her poetry and in her essays. Uh, she recurs to it over and over again, which is, number one, her she had a sister who was born before her, and the sister died, I think died in, in childbirth or, or, or died shortly after childbirth. And so she has often written about sort of being haunted by this sister. Her first collection of poems is called Firstborn, which refers either to her sister, who was the firstborn child in the family, but who died, or ironically to herself, who was the firstborn, given that the sister died. And so she often writes of this haunting, as well as of her relationship, sometimes tense, with her younger sister. So that's one thing she writes about. And she also writes about her struggle in adolescence with anorexia, as I mentioned in my discussion of Frank Bedart, who wrote on that theme in his poem, Ellen West. And we talked about sort of the ethics of Bedart's use of anorexia as a kind of metaphor for for what the poet does in rejecting the merely given and the merely natural. And we talked about how on the one hand, that might be sort of problematic, but on the other hand, Glick, who experienced anorexia, wrote about it in very similar terms in her own poetry and her own essays. Uh, and she didn't glamorize it. She talked about how it almost killed her as a teenager and psychoanalysis saved her, but how it came from the same impulse as the impulse to write poetry, the impulse to order and transcend reality. And so that is Glick's background. She attended Sarah Lawrence College and Columbia University without taking a degree, but then later when she became a prominent poet, um, she later taught at Yale and at other colleges and universities and has published 12 uh, uh, collections of poetry and two books of essays. Uh, and her poetry is characterized by a style of extreme sort of terseness and spareness. Now, she does change styles from book to book, but it's usually still free verse in a kind of understated tone. She does not usually rhyme. She doesn't use a regular meter. And she's even written uh, written in her more technical essays on poetry that she thinks that essentially the sentence has replaced the line for the contemporary poet because the line is no longer organized by those patterns of regular patterns of stressed and unstressed syllables the lines relations to one another are no longer organized by rhyme and so the poet usually in the same way that the prose writer does organizes their writing through sentences through what is called in, uh, in her writing and in the way the Norton bio characterized it, syntax. So she writes this very syntactical rather than very sound-oriented poetry. And she tends to have two modes, I would say. One of them is close to confessional poetry. She has written an essay that they mention in the, in, in the Norton bio called Against Sincerity, where she basically said that poets shouldn't just write shouldn't just I think she was really writing against identity politics which she has not been all that sympathetic to and she was saying that the poet shouldn't just write about his or her own life and expect to be congratulated just for sort of putting their own life on paper and she has stated she's made other statements that sort of are are not too sympathetic to identity politics for instance she talks about how 
you remember Adrian Rich talked about prior male poets as this book of myths in which in which our names as women do not appear uh this rejection of the of the literary canon and glick has said that that wasn't her experience at all that she sort of sees herself in some direct way as the inheritor of classic male uh, poets like Shakespeare and Blake and Keats and T.S. Eliot and these canonical male figures. So she is not really sympathetic to some of these, uh, some of the what we were looking at. Maybe she harks back in certain ways to Elizabeth Bishop, you remember, who was also, she came before identity politics and was kind of hostile to it when it arose in her lifetime. And I think we see something similar with Glick, this rejection of uh, of identity or of sort of saying that she is uh, in some politically subversive way a female poet or a Jewish poet. Um, so that's one thing. But nevertheless, having said all that, she does write in this personal mode. A lot of her poetry is autobiographical and family oriented about her relationships to her parents. She writes about the death of her father and mother as they occur. Um, and her relationship with her husbands and uh, with her son. And so there is this autobiographical vein. And then she also writes dramatic monologues. She's very good at dramatic monologues, just as Frank Bedard is. And she's excellent at writing dramatic monologues from the point of view of like figures from mythology or the Bible or fairy tales. So she has a famous poem about Gretel from the Hansel and Gretel story. She has famous poems from the point of view of the characters in the Odyssey by Homer. Uh, and she has poems from the point of view of biblical figures. Um, so she has these kind of two styles. And what we get in the excerpts that were given in the Norton Anthology is uh, the poem I asked you to read, October, is closer to the autobiographical style, though it's really not very personal. It's more just a meditation on an emotional state of mind, as we'll see. So these are th th these are some of the styles and tones and ideas around Louise Glick. Now, what is it that has made her perhaps the most prominent living American poet right now, which is not a way I would have described her if I was teaching this class a year ago? Well, what happened is something that does not happen for any American writer regularly is that in November of 2020, she was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. And this is considered the highest literary prize you can win really in the world just as the nobel prize in physics or medicine or economics uh you know the, uh, these are considered the nobel prize is considered sort of the gold standard in the fields in which it is awarded and literature is one of the fields in which it is awarded and louise glick wins in 2020 and they don't give it to americans that often the last american we read that received it was tony morrison in 1993 they went through a very long period of over 20 years of not giving it to an American and the awarding body even making statements like, well, we don't basically we don't like American literature that much. We find it insular and isolated from the world. But they broke the streak in 2016 when they gave it to Bob Dylan, which was a radical gesture, not only because they gave it to an American writer, but because they gave it to somebody who's really not in a strict sense, a writer at all. I mean, he is a writer. He's a songwriter and a musician, but he's not primarily a writer for the page. He's a writer for this musical performance. So that was interesting. And and I would happily teach lyrics by Bob Dylan, which I think work as poetry in a lot of ways, but they're not in the Norton Anthology. Maybe they'll be in the next one. And then surprisingly, nobody really expected this, uh, they sometimes try to be unpredictable. They gave it to Louise Glick in 2020. And it's not, you know, it's it's not usual for them to give it to, to Americans so, so soon after one another. And I don't, they hadn't given it to an American poet who was just a poet for the page in many, many years. I think T.S. Eliot was probably the last one who got it in the, in the 50s. So Louise Glick has, in the last few months, I think, gone to the forefront of American poetry and of American literature. And all her books, you know, immediately uh, came back into print with new editions and uh, 
with uh, with stickers on them to say winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. And I I had never I'd read maybe two or three poems by Louise Glick before November of 2020, and she got the prize. And I I took notice and immediately started reading much more of her her work, and I'm now much more conversant with her work than I was certainly this time last year. So that's Louise Glick. Um, very prominent poet right now. And the quote from the Norton, they talk about the sort of persona of her poetry. Uh, this portrait of a superior knowing child anticipates the oracular prophetic tone we sometimes hear in Glick's work. And I think those are the words oracular as if say, said by an oracle, a prophet, one who can see the future, a visionary. Um, oracular is very much what I would call the poem October, which I asked you to read, which is, again, is a, it's a too long a poem to read in its entirety, and I just want to look at a couple of passages. I did also ask you to read her early poem, <clears throat> the first selection in the anthology called The Drowned Children, just to show you a quality of her work that is often uh, remarked upon, which is its, its darkness, its kind of... Uh, understated darkness. So I'm not going to read you that poem either, but the point of that poem, and it's kind of very shocking, is that children who have drowned are just sort of going back to where they came from fairly recently, uh, since they just sort of recently entered life from the nothingness that precedes life and from the watery environment of the womb. If they die, they, they're they just sort of going back where they came from not so very long ago. And so she understatedly suggests it's, it's not that big a deal. And so this is something we've encountered, and I, I don't know if I've done a very good job articulating it very well, but it's something we've encountered in a couple of writers so far this semester. Flannery O'Connor was one. Um, Louise Erdrich was one both fiction writers, and I think in poetry, Louise Glick is one, where what they write about is so, I, I've tried to explain this before, I'm going to try one more time, Can is so over the top bad that it becomes funny. They write about something bad in such an exaggerated way that they they provoke startled laughter rather than uh, tears or or screams, if you know what I mean. There's this dark humor at work in writers like Flannery O'Connor and Louise Erdrich and Louise Glick that I think is very much kind of, they're trying to be anti-sentimental. They're kind of trying to refuse sentimentality. And they're trying to show, I think, a very clear-eyed appraisal of harsh reality that is sometimes so harsh that you laugh instead of crying or screaming, which might be the more natural reaction to what they write about. So I think that's a feature of Glick's work, is this kind of dark humor. Uh, we don't see that so much in October, though there are some kind of, there are some understated lines that I think provoke a, a bit of laughter. Um, October, an interesting thing about October is that they describe it in the Norton anthology, and it's described, I looked uh, on Wikipedia as well, as, uh, as Glick's response to the attacks of September 11th. Because it's a poem I think she originally publishes in its own little book in 2004, and then it's published in a collection of poems called Averno in 2006. And what, what I find interesting about that is there's absolutely no way of knowing that from reading the poem. It's completely apolitical, as her poetry is always completely apolitical. There's no references to this world historical event or its fallout. Uh, it's a poem called October, and I think if you read it without September 11th in your mind, what you would think of was that it was really a poem about nature. It's a poem about the way that the natural cycle subjects human beings as well as the natural world to this inevitable death 
that uh, that autumn is the season where things are dying and preparing to go down to the death, which is winter, before they will rise again in the spring. And so it's a subjective experience of the poet's autumnal state of mind, the state of mind of shutting down, of preparing for death, of, uh, of withering, of, uh, of, uh, of, of falling off the tree, etc. Now, what is this? I don't doubt that it's in some sense her response to September 11th. And there are re there are references throughout the poem to violence. Violence has changed me. But again, I think that could just be a reference to the violence of that every human life is subjected to. Now, again, I'm sure she wrote it in response to September 11th in the sense that it's her attempt to come to grips with death. And the, and the word October suggests the aftermath of this terrible event that had happened in the month of September. But nevertheless, you would just never get it. You would never, you would never know that from just reading the poem. There is no indication in the poem that it's supposed to have this political resonance. So that's interesting in itself, that she's a poet who subtracts the outer world in a lot of ways. Her, her poetry is really, really apolitical, especially for a poet of her generation. And I'm not saying you can't find political issues in it, especially ones related to gender, because they're there, but they're nothing that she encourages you to find in, on the surface of the text. And she certainly almost never refers to anything capital P political, like, uh, like political events uh, in the way that some of the other writers we've read throughout the semester have. So I'm going to look at a few passages. Again, uh, Glick has uh, sung the praises of Frank Bedart, and I think I see some similarities between this poem and Ellen West, particularly in the way that this poem evokes the idea of the mind at war with physical reality. Um, you hear this voice. <laughs> so one of the things I like about this poem is there's this kind of taunting quality to the speaker. The speaker's always asking us questions in this challenging way. You hear this voice? This is my mind's voice. You can't touch my body now. It has changed once. It has hardened. Don't ask it to respond again. A day like a day in summer, exceptionally still. The long shadows of the maples nearly mauve on the gravel paths, and in the evening, warmth. Night like a night in summer. It does me no good. Violence has changed me. My body has grown cold like the stripped fields. Now there is only my mind, cautious and wary, with the sense it is being tested. Once more the sun rises as it rose in summer, bounty, balm after violence, balm after the leaves have changed, after the fields have been harvested and turned. Tell me this is the future. I won't believe you. Tell me I'm living. I won't believe you. So as in Ellen West, we have a poetic speaker, though in this case, presumably an autobiographical speaker, the voice of the poet, saying, my mind is separate from my body. My body is part of nature. Nature and my body have been subjected to this violent change symbolized by autumn coming on. And so all that's left to resist is my mind. The only part of me that's living is my mind. Only my mind can resist this horror <clears throat> of violence, which I, I suppose is the great political violence of this era of 9-11 and the wars that followed. But again, they're not mentioned in the poem, so we're left with a kind of universal violence of of nature and its cycles and the inevitable death it produces. Now, uh, what what is the poet's role here? So I have two excerpts that I want to end with. So we saw in Li Young Lee, who is, I think, an, essentially a religious poet, he had this idea that the poet ultimately is this kind of visionary that joins unlike things together. So he had a, while he was interested in the postmodern critique of language, he nevertheless, I think, ultimately saw a somewhat more traditional role that the poet had occupied in pre-modernist times, whether that was in 
uh, China or Germany or the United States, given the various influences he's calling upon, where the poet is this kind of visionary that brings order uh, back to the world as the poem Persimmons links these unlike things. I think Glick sees a more modest role for the poet. Uh, she doesn't have this visionary role for the poet necessarily. The poet is what she has the poet being in October, which is this voice of the mind who is all that is left in a world that is uh, that is subject to violence, and this mind is commenting on that world. So with her understated wit and humor, she says, it is true there is not enough beauty in the world. It is also true that I am not competent to restore it. Neither is there candor, and here I may be of some use. So she disclaims the old role of the poet as bringing beauty to the world. But she says, what I can be is candid, what I can be is honest. And I think that links us back to her dark humor as we saw it in The Drowned Children, which uncompromisingly looks at the reality of death. So we've had, maybe we can, we can almost, this probably goes too far, but I'm almost tempted to drop a, a, a chart where we could put the poets we've read this semester on one of two sides. There were the poets and, and writers and of fiction and nonfiction and whatever, the, the writers of infinite possibility, the Grace Paley's, the Ursula K. Le Guin's, the Thomas Pynchon's, uh, the writers who saw well, the Ishmael reads, uh, the writers who see that there is really no limit to, to life, that we can sort of endlessly imagine new ways of being and new futures for ourselves. Uh, we even see this in the idealism of Blanche Dubois. So we could put Tennessee Williams tracing the visionary company of love in this category. And then on the other side of the ledger, we have Flannery O'Connor and Joan Didion and uh, and Louise Glick, uh, who tend to see and to focus much more on the limitations that there are in the world, the ways in which we are not really free to live uh, in a world of infinite possibility. So that's one. Just that's just one way of drawing up the different writers. We've read a we've read an enormous number of diverse writers, and I think there's many different ways we can compare and contrast them but that's one of them and i think glick is a writer who says kind of like flannery o'connor or like uh, philip roth or like joan didion uh what you're going to get from me is the hard truth <laughs> you're not going to get an infinite number of possibilities you're not going to get an infinite belief in human self-transformation you're not going to get a utopian vision you're going to get the hard truth that's the thing i can do that's the thing i can give you so you know, it's maybe a more more severe, more conservative vision, uh, not in a strictly political sense, but as a sensibility, as a temperament. So she says, candor is what I can give you. However, candor helps. And she notes this. There's a, there's a moment where the speaker recollects being young and taking the subway, because remember, this is a nature poem. Most of her poems about being an adult take place in nature. I think Glick has mostly lived in rural life or small town life as an adult but she grew up in a more urban setting so she from the point of view of so, so the present speaker is talking about sort of the fields around her but she recollects being a child growing up in a more urban environment uh, riding the subway and she says i you know i remember reading on the subway I was young here, riding the subway with my small book as though to defend myself against this same world. You are not alone, the poem said in the dark tunnel. So while it seems modest that all the poet can provide is this sometimes grim candor, rather than providing us with the infinitude of possibilities that other writers have presented us. Nevertheless, this helps because we are all subject to aging, to violence, to death, to going through the dark tunnel. There is some dark tunnel that every single person will go through eventually. And the candor of the poem uh, and of the poet who tells you, I've been through this too, you are not alone, provides us with some consolation.
And so that is what this now most celebrated of living American poets, Louise Glick, leaves us with. And so there I will leave you. Uh, that is it for Louise Glick. Thanks very much and have a great day.